I was in the past and know who I am, but uh, my name is Tim Howard. I'm one of the founders of Vish. Uh, and this idea for Vish came from just being in the industry for so many years myself, owning a couple of salons and really seeing a need to gain control of the waste of the color bar was the initial idea, but has since morphed into many different things where, you know, we are helping salons like we're talking today, really look at service pricing and how to maximize everything they're doing at the color bar, uh, uh, reducing costs and increasing profitability. Um, so I'm happy to have Laura Watkins join today and Laura's from Pure Salon and Spa in Kentucky. Uh, Laura and I have worked together for many years. I said back in my day when I was an educator uh, for Aveda, I go down to Laura's salon and do some education there with her team. And I've actually been down recently. Um, so let uh, in just a minute, Laura, I'll get you to introduce yourself. And then Jeremy, I do uh, both. I can't, I, I always mess up your last name. Can you Bakich. Bakich. Uh, yeah. Jeremy's in Canada, uh, same as myself. He's on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. And Jeremy owns Head Candy Salons, very successful salons in Canada, um, and has been using both. Uh, Laura and Jeremy have been using fish for some time now. So, uh, Laura, if you wouldn't mind, uh, maybe just giving yourself an introduction and um, yeah, a little background, how long you've been in the industry, et cetera. I'm Laura Watkins. I own Pure Salon Spa in Louisville, Kentucky, and we've been around for about 14 years now. Uh, we are an Aveda concept salon. We are a team-based pay salon, so we pay hourly, and we are in the process of switching over to time-based services for all of our color services. And we've been, we've used Vish, I think, since 2018. So we've- Yeah, you were one of our first users. Yeah, I was an early adopter, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've, you've definitely been with us and seen, uh, you know, seen a lot of changes. And uh, thank you for joining today. And I'm really happy to, to pull some of your knowledge and expertise into this webinar. Um, sure, thanks for having me. Pleasure. And Jeremy, how about you? Would you want to give an introduction of yourself and talk about your business? Sure. Uh, I'm Jeremy Bogic, um, Hey Candy Salon. I have a couple other brands, Butter Beauty Parlor and Johnny's. Uh, obviously, we just use Vish in the hair salons. Uh, we've been around for 23 years now. Um, yeah, and we've got probably about 100 staff that we're working with. So working with Vish has been uh, really, really amazing. I think it's something our industry needed for years, and it gives the salon owner a, a hope of making it. So, <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, okay, so the main discussion points for today's webinar, uh, as we know, the topic for the month is uh, is it time to change your pricing? So we'll be talking about all things salon pricing structure and gaining insight from various salon uh, and Vish users. So we're gonna break down the, the main pricing structures and the key benefits, pain points, and maybe get some insight from Jeremy and Laura on how to implement these into our salon. So again, you know, just sort of going over what we're gonna be talking about. So we always have, of course, all-inclusive pricing. And I think this is pretty much the model that everyone adopted in the industry or used in the industry since we started doing hair color, um, you know, because there was no system in place like Vish before. It's very hard to have insight into separate product products and allowing so much product in. There was no real automation that took place there. So the all-inclusive pricing would then usually uh, rely upon the hairdresser voluntarily uh, adding extra charges to it as they, as they see, as they saw, or as they needed to. But as we've discovered, and there's no surprise to everybody, that's inconsistent. So what ends up happening is it, it ends up not being charged by always when it should be. So there's a lot of money walking out the door, uh, which is one problem. But the second problem is also the inconsistency for the customer. And, you know, all the interactions that we've had with customers, we know that Two of the main reasons why they don't come back to a salon for hair color is because the hair color results are inconsistent. But the other, second reason is the pricing is inconsistent. Today, I charge you for that extra bowl of color. Next time I didn't, they don't know why the price is fluctuating. So we'll talk about all-inclusive a little bit. Uh, we're also gonna talk about parts and labor. So with Vish, uh, you, we're able to do parts and labor pricing, which uh, what we do is we take out the product from the cost of the service. 
So let's say you do a, you know, a new growth application or a retouch application. Your, your service price is $75 plus whatever product is used in that with a markup. And typically that markup is 100% markup uh, as it is with most products and, and uh, from your inventory that you carry. And that way what the salons are able to do is just charge and, and, and pay commission on the service or the hourly. Um, so you can do it two ways. You can completely separate parts and labor or maybe have the, some product included. So that same new growth that we talked about, perhaps including 30 or 40 grams of color with it based on our recommendations and, and what's the culture of your salon. And then anytime there's an overage that gets, um, that gets charged uh, and, and is collected from the customer. Um, but then we're also going to talk about time-based pricing. So how do you set up your, your service menu so that it is also equally profitable and also very straightforward to plan it out for you know, projections? Um, so hourly based pricing, we're gonna talk about that quite a bit today. Um, so if you could, and whoever wants to start, uh, tell us about your salon pricing structure and how it's evolved over time. Whoever wants to go ahead. Ladies first, Laura. Okay. So in the beginning, um, Tim and I have talked about this. I, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? Like many of us when we start. Um, and so really my pricing structure at the beginning was basically calling around to the other salons in the area where we were gonna go in and seeing what they were charging. And then you know, I had the, the perception we're in a Veda salon, so we had, you know, we're going to be a little higher level, so I'll make my prices a little bit, a little bit more expensive than that. But it was not based on any type of analytics or um, what it was going to cost to perform the service. It was just kind of a guess. Um, luckily, through education and experience, um, you know, we, we do things very differently now. And especially with Vish, we know drill down to the service and the provider who is performing the service exactly what the cost is involved with that. So we have done a lot of work around um, determining what it costs per hour to operate and perform a particular service. And then we price things based on that with some profitability built in. So that's kind of where we are today. Great. And can we talk about that? Because that's going to be very different. And for those of you, maybe actually before we start into that, Laura, can you describe um, team-based pay for some people who may not know what that is? Sure. So um, we did a lot of work with strategies uh, several years ago. They are um, an education training-based company, um, and they teach this concept called team-based pay, which Basically, everyone is paid an hourly wage that's guaranteed for, um, you know, the number of hours that they work for the week. And it's a very team approach. So it is in our culture, it's very common for people to see multiple providers. Um, and it, you know, there's a, just like with any type of compensation model, there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, but for the most part, it helps us, again, to know exactly what our costs are per hour. We can budget payroll a lot better. Um, and then we're able to, we, we do wage reviews uh, once a year, and we do evaluations every 90 days. And based on how they're performing as an entire employee, um, determines their hourly wage. So it's not just based on what they can bring in the door and what they can sell. Um, it also has to do with, are they a good team player? Do they come to work on time? Are they in dress code? And it kind of evaluates the entire performance of the provider. And how did that, thank you for that. And how did that factor and how does that work with the hourly based pricing? Is it, is it, was it much of a, a consideration? Like was there many, many, uh, things you need to look out for in order to set up the new structure with going with an hourly uh, service menu? No, not really. Um, I think it, it for us, it just helps really kind of drill down because we also have four tiers of pricing. So, um, you know, it helps us drill down to by tier to see exactly what those costs are as well. 
right. um, because we can include exact payroll into that amount. Okay. All right, great. And then if you could, um, what, what, made, what led you to the decision to move to hourly based um, service menu pricing? Um, well, coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, inflation, everything, we did a price increase in January and it basically, I, I didn't see any, it wasn't enough and I didn't see enough of a change um, in profitability. So it was almost like I was just keep catching up to, to where inflation was. And so it, it just, you know, I, I, want to be able to provide more for my team. I want to be able to pay them better. I want to be able to offer them benefits and education. And, um, right. you know, it takes more profit to do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then Jeremy, same for you. So how is your pricing structure and how has it evolved over time? Um, so, yeah, our Pricing structure started just like how you said, everything was all included. We charge, we run it through as commission <clears throat> for our team. And then each service is a la carte. So it's a highlight, a toner, a base, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and we've been doing that for 21 years. Um, and I always found it to be really, really challenging um, having your color charges built right into the into your commissions. Because I think the biggest challenge I don't, as a stylist, I didn't like paying uh, service charges. I always right. felt like if I'm getting paid 50% commission and I look at my check, it looks like I'm getting paid whatever, whatever that number ends up being. So it was always a fight I found with my staff, which I totally understood because I felt the same way when I was in their position. Um, so as soon as it was, an, we, as soon as we had the opportunity to move to parts and labor, um, we just did it immediately. Because it just, to me, it just made the most amount of sense. We adjusted the pricing to take that service charge right out. So, um, and started using Vish and going directly with parts and labor, which um, it's been a real eye opener on many, many different ways. Uh, for the clients, I think it's really great because they get to see how much color they're using. For the stylists, if they charge $100 and they get 50%, they know what their check is going to be. They know every, it's just the transparency that we're always trying to uh, get to. And we're, we're very transparent. I probably am known as an oversharer as it is, but we want to get just get to a place where we know what they're getting paid. They know what they're getting paid. So parts and labor works really, really well for us. Um, I think it's an eye opener for the staff just to see how expensive color is because we were never collecting what we should have. Like a toner, we would collect $7 for a toner where we know that toners are two to three ounces of color. So they're, yeah. we're just barely making it. Um, while the stylist still wouldn't charge extra for bowls, wouldn't it was just it was a complete nightmare. So this is this has been really good, and we've been able to change our commissions as well and raise those because we're actually collecting the right amount of money from color. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is works for us for sure. Yeah, it's really clean when you're able to see that product separated and ensure that you're collecting it back. And like you said, yeah. I mean, you know, the amount of times I've had a hairdresser walk into my salon and you know, applying for a job and they say, well, the salon up the street is going to give me 55% commission. And then I look at what they're offering them and they're giving them 40% commission because they're taking right. up so many charges. So it's really being able to have transparency between your guests mm -hmm. and your staff um, and then being fair when you can. So how does your service menu work then? Um, so do you, do you do hourly? Sorry if I missed that part. Like, do you know- oh, We're commissioned. Yeah, but do you know what your hourly? By the way, it's kind of it breaks out to an hourly. Like I think anything, everything is six and one half dozen. Like it's everything breaks out into a commission or hourly. It breaks into, like, Laura's is going to be if you can work it backwards, you're going to you can work it into what you're paying your team as a commission. So ours is hourly. Our we originally set it up. I don't know, 15, 17 years ago, we started working with this uh, Summit Business Centers. Um, and with, through our consultant, we came up with our six levels and we started level one being this and every level jump, you got a $9 raise on cuts and seven on color. And we just kind of worked through that and then just price increases. But they've always based on, like if we're gonna do a corrective color, we'll base that on an hourly, which would be your haircut price divided by three times by four and we get to ourselves. Uh, highlight our color price kind of thing so it's a it's a 
fit it in the mix. What about your menu itself, though, the service menu? Mm -hmm. How do you determine, like, how do you determine uh, how much a full head highlight is versus a half head highlight? Like, is that there's no half have, heads? Oh, pardon me. We don't do half heads. Like, we do color service, like a highlight, a base, a toner, a balayage. We don't really have halves. Um, okay. We just have so, services. So, how do you how do you structure that pricing then for the customer? Is it based on like we, you know, we're X amount per hour? Is that what that's what our hair color? Based on the level of the stylist and their experience, uh, mm -hmm. demand on their time, their education. So a level one is going to be whatever, $100. And a level three would be 121 or 130 bucks for a highlight. So it just depends on the levels, how busy they are, that sort of thing. Okay. And then product is separate on top of that. Uh, and does that product is separate. Pay into your haircuts as well? Like, we so, level our haircuts as well. Okay, so you have an hourly rate because I know that was one of the questions that I kept coming up. So when I we used to do hourly charging in our salon, and if some haircuts I was based, let's say one hundred fifty dollars an hour, and somebody took me an hour and twenty minutes to do a haircut, I would take it and I would charge over. I mean, it would just be based on that. Do you both and this, whoever wants to answer that when something like let's say it is a highlight and. You know, you book an hour for the application or 45 minutes for the application, but this person has a little bit more and it's taking the hairdresser longer. How do you adjust for that? Do you like, do you charge if it's based on an hourly rate and they take an hour and 15 minutes? Do you charge that extra 15? We do. Um, and we do it according to the hourly weight or the hourly rate just divided by four. And that's their extra 15 minute charge. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and so, and then next time we pre-book it at that. For that. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So that was my next question. How do you, because I'm, you know, with the initial visit is when you really figure all this stuff out. Right. Um, how is that communicated to the guest? And is there much pushback from the guest when your estimate is, you know, is not quite your, what your original estimate to what the final bill is quite different. We, we don't get a ton of pushback on that. Typically people who have long, thick, you know, most of the time they know, and they've already been charged that extra somewhere else. Um, of course, with anything, the more the stylist recommends and, and educates, the less pushback you get. Of course. Um, and, and then... Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I'll ask you a question just on that point. Um, That's okay. I do it all the time. <laughs> so, and then if we talked about increases, so Jeremy, when was the last time you did a price increase, a service menu price increase at your salon? And when, what triggers that? How do you, how do you know it's time to raise your prices? Uh, typically, like when we do it for the entire company, we would do it every 12 to 18 months. With inflation, we would just raise our prices by a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, depending. Through the pandemic, we really haven't done a lot because it's just been it's been a bit of a disaster area as far as clients coming and all that. So since we've come back, we're just in the process uh, going into staff meetings this week. We're going to raise all of our prices um, straight across the board, anywhere between two to four dollars, and then. We're always raising prices because our staff is getting level jumps right? at least once a year kind of thing. So they're always going up in prices and then we just level it off the entire company once a year to okay. just, just because we need to. You need to do that. Just, yeah. You Absolutely. just need to do that. If we don't do that, then we're pricing it like 1984. Okay. So the next question I have, uh, and again, either one of you at any time, jump in and answer these. How do you decide or how would you suggest to a fellow salon owner about which pricing structure to use. So if you were to, you know, consult with somebody, you know, about to open a salon, how would you help them determine which way they should go? Well, that's a tough, yeah, that's a tough question. Go ahead, Laura. This is somewhat vague, and but I, I thought a little bit about this. I think it really is personal preference. Like what, what makes the most sense to you as the owner personally? Yeah. Um, but again, the way I did it in the beginning, I would not suggest, <laughs> I think you really have to have, 
you know, you have to do some analysis and really know what your costs are going to be um, to set to set yourself up for success. And then, Laura, where do you sit in your region? Jeremy, same question for you, actually. Where do you sit in terms of what you're charging based on the average in, this, in the in your area? Are you above that? Are you way above that? Um, so in our area, there are other what I would call like big head big hitter Aveda salons. And right. so for the longest time, I always felt like, well, I'm not as big as so and so, or I haven't been around as long as so and so. So I always felt like I had to price my services a little bit lower than that. Um, but you know, after so long in the industry and we've we've built a great brand and reputation, I'm I'm done with that thinking. So as far as Aveda salons, we're gonna be pretty on par. Um, in general, I feel like Aveda salons charge more than your average salon. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I think, I mean, with my exposure so far. And how about you, Jeremy? What, um, you know, where do you sit amongst your competitors? In terms of price, I think we would sit um, above average for okay. for our city. Um, there's, it seems to me, there's always had there's one or two stylists here and there that are really expensive. But as far as a salon company goes, um, there's only a handful of probably overall stylists charging as much as we do. Um, okay. So yeah. Okay. And then what is your target? So I know Laura, with you do team-based pay and I know how, how that works. Jeremy, where, where do you target your commission? Is it, is it you know, do, do you mind talking about that? No, no, no I'm fine. So, so we, yeah, I can talk about like So that we start them at 50% and go to 55%. As okay. we started going through the pandemic and really our commissions for years started at 40 and went up from there by 3% every level. And as I started to go through and really look at it, we have to pay our staff 15 bucks an hour, regardless of when they're there. So when you start going through and doing the math on it, we were never paying them 40% commission. We were always paying them closer to 50, 60, 70, 80% commission. So as time started to change and stylists were coming in, when I started to do the numbers, I really realized that if we, if we collect the right amount of money through color and we're not losing money there, we can say we're paying 50% commission because that's what we are paying and that's what we actually would be paying then instead of saying they get 40% commission but they never actually get that because yeah. we're paying them hourly. So and that's kind of, that's how we did it. So just over the last kind of year and a half, we changed it to 50% commission starting or 15 bucks an hour, whichever is higher. And um, that seems to have really worked well. It's we're all, I think all owners are trying to get to the same number at the bottom or a number at the bottom that works for them. So, and when you have stylists or you have salons in your industry, in your market saying, well, I'm going to pay you 55% commission and it's not really apples to apples. Yeah. You just have to get kind of creative and saying, well, 50% for us is going to be 50%. So it works. So and this is a little off topic from what this webinar is about, about the pricing of the service menu, but I think this is relevant, um, just information for everybody to have out there, because you both have very different models, and I'm wondering how it helps you compete and to recruit uh, new new talent, new hairdressers, or you know people in the industry. So Jeremy, with you offering, I think, higher than average commission structure, whereas Laura, you're offering an hourly rate. How, how does that play into your recruitment? I think for us, um, we've, in the 20 years that we've had, we very rarely have ever hired a stylist. We grow them through our associate program, put them on the floor. Um, and over this last probably 90 days, we've hired into the company 18 people. Some of them are our stylists. So if you've got somebody with any type of experience, if you're going to try to offer them 40% commission, I don't think it would work. Like I just, I don't yeah. think since we've changed our commissions and really opened that up, we've got a lot of really amazing hairdressers that are coming knocking on our door with 10, 15 years experience that are just willing and wanting to get into the, into the industry with us where that, that door really wasn't open before. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, we do our butter brand. We just flipped over to hourly wage. Um, and that's, I think, been really, really great because it keeps them as a consistent amount of money throughout yeah. their entire year. So yeah. at least from a stylist point of view, 
Um, cause we we're really open with the way we, we talk to them about their commission, but every month when we coach, we back that commission right out to an hourly wage anyways. So we're always talking both sides of it. Um, right. and if you're a smart stylist or haven't like you, you care about your money, you are looking at your hourly, you are looking at your commission. Um, so we're always kind of talking about that. What, and what does their hourly look like when you start putting in your retail commission and you start putting in your tips? Because your gratuities are such a huge part of what we do. They're running anywhere between 40%, 40 to 50% of what they actually get to take home. So it's a, it's a big number. So we're putting those numbers in there and really trying to grow intelligent hairstylists that know about money and our business people, not just people behind the hair cutting, behind the chair cutting. Yeah. Yeah, that is something important. I mean, as we look at education and we teach them a lot of skills to improve their hairdressing abilities, finance is one of the things that we really, especially with a lot of the younger talent that we have coming in the door. You know, they're not learning in high school. They're not learning in hair school. It is really our responsibility to help them with their finances and so that they know how to budget uh, and to plan their future. How about you, Laura? How does recruitment with an hourly base or team-based pay, um, how does that work for you? Well, the majority of stylists that we hire are new out of school. So one of the things that's appealing as a brand new stylist is, you know, they're guaranteed an hourly wage, no matter what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, after a year in the salon, many of them with tips and everything, um, you know, they're able to really see an increase that first year which is great. Um, and then I completely agree with educating them. You know, a lot of them, they don't know how taxes work. They don't know how, um, how to really read their paycheck. So we do a lot of educating around what, what actually is in your compensation, how to read your paycheck, what you're getting paid, but then above and beyond what you're being compensated in the way of paid education and paid time off and, um, you know, monthly bonuses that we offer through team-based pay too. So I think it's, it, a lot of it has to do with educating them on not only what they're being paid in their hourly wage, but how they're being compensated in those other ways that don't, you know, they don't tie in necessarily to that wage. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and then, so how does data play a role in your decision to switch pricing? So I know, Jeremy, you said you've done this for a long time, but you know, when, when did you make the decision to go with parts and labor and, and how, how did that work? And was Vish part of that? Like how, what, what part of that, the data made you make that decision? Um, I, for us, it just, it all, kind of came together at the same time. As soon as the technology was there to be able to make the change, it happened to be at the same time um, we were changing software companies. So we did at the beginning of the year, uh, software company changed, we changed over the parts and labor at the exact same time. And it was an easy transition for our guests and our stylists because it was like, okay, this is new. Um, we could talk about how technology has finally caught up to us in our industry and it was an easy crossover to be able to go okay, this is from the client's point of view like laura's color and my color on my head should not cost the same amount of color uh generally so we were just trying to really get clear with our guests saying your color price that the stylist works on you for so if it's a hundred dollars it's always going to be that price unless they do extra work or whatever they have to do on it and then the color side of it is just going to be separate um, so that they get a better understanding. So for us, it was a it was perfect timing to be able to put the technology in with the crossover of a brand new software company, um, and everything fell into place. So it was it was fairly easy because every client had to set up a new um, online booking code. So they they knew what was going on. They knew everything was happening that was new. So for us, it was it was pretty easy. I was really fortunate. My team was um, for the most part pretty open to having this happen. We talked about forever and ever and ever we talk about extra color charges and how expensive color is and trying to stay in budget for all of those things they're probably so sick and tired of hearing about it yeah. that they were happy to try something new and not have to really totally hear about it and then the understanding of what goes into 
a color because it's just not a bottle of color. It's there's so many other aspects that goes into the color price. When they is there a markup on color? Well, yeah, there is because it's not the color that I'm paying for. It's the color. It's the towels. It's like it's the whole thing. We all know that. All and carrying that inventory and all that. Other yeah. Activity. Yeah, we've got probably ten or fifteen thousand dollars worth of color sitting on the wall yeah. in one location at any yeah. time. So it, it's expensive. Yeah. And some of it oxidizes and the tubes go bad for sure. I mean, there's so much to consider with that. Oh, so for sure. in terms of um, just on, before we move on to Laura and how that worked for her with your team, you know, switching into parts and labor. So, you know, for the customer, I think it's quite easy because they get to explain it. You know, you can show them exactly how much color is being used. Was there any pushback from your team um, in terms of them feeling like they're losing money or, you know, that, that, that they're not going to make as much because you're keeping that. And I'm assuming you don't pay commission on the product charges that come through. No. Um, there really wasn't a ton. The biggest pushback was probably just using the system okay. and just getting used to doing it. But we were really quite clear and broke everything out um, and explained that this is, let's say there's $20, your highlights are 100 there's $20 service charge inside of there. So now your highlights are 80. So we were pretty clear as to how we figured it out. We went through the whole thing, took out the service charges. So their clients may, and, I, and we said, if you were charging the right amount of money for your guests, they're not going to see anything different either because we never changed their color price. But if you were charging extra color, or like you're supposed to be, your clients will be getting charged at the exact same amount. So right. we just kind of kept putting it back onto them. I said, like, I know some of you, haven't been charging for color because we can see that in our color costs. Um, so some of your clients will notice a change, but it is what it is. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah, great. For sure. So that would probably the, be the biggest thing is just um, going back and having them make sure that the color is being mixed in the system. Um, but the reway is something that we just really helps us understand who's actually using the machine. And we've taken out every other scale inside of the salon. So, um, and really made it quite clear that if you don't use the system, you won't be working here anymore because we can't afford to have you. Um, and that really snapped things into shape pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the things that we covered in Laura when I asked the same question, but you know, what I'm constantly helping salons pay attention to are those services in your menu that you're doing that are not profitable like they should be. Some of them, they're at a loss and they're always the same. It's the all over color, it's toners. Um, it's rarely a bleaching service because bleach you know, typically costs you half or less than half than the cost of, of permanent hair color and direct dye is a demi-permanent. So, you know, it's, it's easy to fill up our service menu and, and do lots of highlights and re remain profitable. But what happens is when you start to do those toners, and when you start to refine that, that bleaching service uh, is when you start to lose profitability. So it's really important. And that's why I think structuring things on an hourly basis and having an hourly rate, um, because it's all too often that I see salon owners only charging $20 for a toner or $30 for a toner and it costing them anywhere from eight to $15 to perform that service before they pay any commission or any hourly rate. So you know, just really breaking that down and making it transparent helps you make sure that every service is equally profitable. Um, and then also, you know, for your team that they can, they know what their rate is so they can make some projections and budget themselves. So Laura, for you, how was the data from Vish? Again, you started with Vish in 2018 uh, and you're making a switch now four years later uh, and doing something different. So how has the data played a role in that for you? Well, just, I mean, just like you said, we can drill down to that particular service and see exactly how much it's costing. Um, and we can even do that by provider to be able to, to coach them. You know, if we have people that are wasting more color or their highlight or not highlight, but maybe they're all over color is costing a little bit more than their peer. Um, that's something that we can coach to. So just having the information um, in the way that we can access it very easily and kind of drill down that that has helped us tremendously. We we actually went to time based haircuts um, probably almost a year ago. So sure. our guests and stylists are were already used to that information. 
Um, and then, you know, when I did that price increase in January and by April or May, I wasn't seeing any, any difference at all. I knew we had to do something a little bit more significant. And so having that information was very vital in being able to plan that out at each hourly rate. So what did you mean by you're not seeing a difference in terms of profitability? Like even when that price raised, it wasn't making the, the, the difference that you needed? Is that what you mean? Right. right. Okay. Okay, perfect. And um, with the profitability, with Jeremy, with you now switching to, you know, since you've moved to parts and labor, um, do you notice the difference in terms of profitability in each location? Like, is it, can you see it? And if you do... Where do those extra profits go? So can you just talk about that for a minute? Just want to get some ideas for, for other salon owners on, you know, what are the benefits of switching? And then what are they doing with the, with the additional, um, with the healthier profit margins when they do come around? I think for us, because we're so big, um, what it did was just bring us back into budget. Um, it was just getting to a place where even when you popped into my head, when you talked about toners, I think our toner price was $25, let's say, um, and we took $5 for color. So it was really, the stylist was getting commission on the $20. They were probably using $15 or $20 worth of color. So there was a lot of services that were happening that we weren't getting the money back for. And we were always fighting to stay in budget inside of our color. So I suspect because we've been doing this for probably it's so like it's it's so hard to talk about like profitability over the last two or three years because um, we, nothing's been normal kind of thing. So we did this with the knowledge to go okay. We did it at the beginning of the pandemic, January, and then we shut down in March. So nothing's been normal for us over the last three years, kind of thing. So I think that it is going to make us profitable. It and if it's done absolutely nothing else, it's made us more transparent to the guest and to the stylist, which is good for culture. Um, and that culture piece is the piece that's going to grow us. Um, so through the last three years, we lost 40% of our team. Um, and now we're re able to regrow it from a place that those questions that come up about not when staff comes and they don't feel like we're paying them fairly, that, that, like, that hurts my heart because we're so transparent that I just want to be able to take care of our team in any way that we can. So the more transparent that we can be is going to grow a better team. And the better team that we grow, the more profitable we'll, we'll be. So we've been able to readjust a lot of things. Putting them on a commission that they can understand is good for us and good for culture. Getting the proper amount of money for color has been really, really great for us. And when we get back to that place, then we're always trying to, we haven't been able to do it yet, but putting in something into place that can we use some of this money from what we're collecting to be able to bonus the team out, to be able to use it for education, those sort of things. We haven't got to that place where we've been able to realize it, but the hope or the, the realization that that's coming is something I'm excited about. That's great. That's great. Yeah. We're always looking at ways to coach because, you know, the one thing that some salons see is that you're, you know, by not giving a commission on the product charges that the hairdresser sometimes feels like something's being taken away. So we're, right. you know, we're talking to salons about, you know, in the U.S. it'd be a 401k, you know, increased healthcare benefits, more education, of course, is the obvious one, but, you know, where, where do we sort of redirect some of that money? Because I, you know, I being a former salon owner, both of you can attest that it doesn't go in our pockets, right? No. It, it gets converted, it gets put back into the business in one way or, the, or another. Yeah. Um, so Laura, for, for you, um, I know it's a little bit different because of team-based pay, but how, how does this price structure change? Um, a, how, does it, how did you have that conversation with your staff? How does it impact their paychecks or does it at all? And then also on the second side of that is how do you then communicate these changes to your customers? Um, well, we are very transparent as well. Um, you know, we, we talk very openly about costs and you know I even probably once a quarter I'll I go through the PL with my staff and I just you know so that they can see what we're spending and how much things cost. Um, so I think you know they have a, a pretty good understanding. They pretty good not you know um, some some better than others. Um, 
I just totally lost my train of thought too. See, it happens to me too. It's Monday <laughs> in the summer, so it's yeah. still excusable. Um, yeah, so just talking about that. So, and then the conversation of the customer, how do you have that, right? Like if, if somebody's been coming to you religiously for every four or six weeks, and now they come back and the bill is different, how do you communicate that? Because I know the barrier usually comes from the hairdresser. Right, that the pushback usually comes from the hairdresser, not the customer. Customers expect to pay more because they're paying more everywhere, right? Yeah. Their, you know, their mortgage payment just went up because the, uh, you know, they just renegotiated their mortgage. You know, I just bought a new car. I'm paying a lot more monthly because, again, the interest rate is much higher. But for the teams, how do you how do you prepare them to to communicate with the guests with the customer? We talk a lot about scripting. Um, I do a communicate like a broad communication out to guests. And, you know, I always try to explain the why and be very transparent about that as well. Um, and then I, you know, we do role play uh, with them. And basically there's a phrase that I learned from strategies a long time ago that it's just kind of basically in order to provide the service that you've come to expect from us, it's now going to cost this. Um, right. And you know, like you said, I feel like now's the time to do it because everywhere you go, you know, restaurants, you're paying more groceries, gas, everywhere, the prices are going up. So, um, you know, I, I hate that it, in some way, because I know that we will lose people. Um, and I, you know, I hate that we, we do have very loyal clientele and, but at the same time, you know, they all, it, it's just, it's the cost of doing business after a pandemic, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, that is true. I mean, now is the time because I think we've held on from doing anything and we just, you know, keeping things as status quo as possible until things return back to normal. And I think we're finally there. One of the things that I'm very proud of with Vish is that we're able to, um, you know, quickly convert or quickly update salons pricing in terms of the products they use on the back end so that, when a manufacturer increases a price every six months or every year, uh, I know as a salon owner, we would just absorb that cost for a couple of years. Right. Usually, until, you know, depending on when that price increase came in, we may see two or three price increases before we raise our service menu. Same. So, you know, what I'm very proud that Vish is able to do is as soon as that price increase comes in from the manufacturer, we're able to switch that right away on our end so that you're not taking the loss when, when there's a four or five or 6% increase. Um, what, if you were both, and this will be, we'll turn this over to a Q&A in a minute, but if you were to open up or maybe, uh, yeah, maybe open up or coach somebody who's opening a salon, what are your top tips on pricing for profitability? What is some advice that you give or how would you approach things differently if you're opening up a brand new salon tomorrow um, and not changing where you are right now? So there are a couple of things. Um, first of all, you have to have, I mean, all of this sounds great and, you know, we have all the information, but you have to have superior inventory management and ordering within a budget. Um, you know, you have to be sure you're on top of, your professional products cost and all of that's being managed very well because the slightest overage here and there can really throw things off. Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, like you got, you and I do, or we we're going to do every quarter is really sit down and look at the analytics and make sure every, the costs are still in line. They're still the same. Um, and if anything changes, being able to kind of pivot and address those changes and then I think you, for us, you know, to really coach the staff on the reway uh, percentage, because that can make a huge change in what you're wasting, um, which is going to affect the cost and, and everything. So, you know, we shoot for 90% or better. And I would say out of the eight providers that use it, at least seven of them are, are at that level, if not really close. Yeah, and that does. I mean, it keeps down the cost for you, keeps down the cost for the customer, and keeps all that you know hazardous color out of our. And it's a simple step; it really takes two or three seconds, but it does right. so many amazing things. 
by a byproduct of simply putting a bowl back on the scale. Uh, thank you for that. And how, how about you, Jeremy? How, how we, what would you advise, or if you were to go open up a brand new salon tomorrow, what would you do differently? And how would you, what are your hot tips for pricing structure? So do all the things that I don't do all the things that I did kind of thing. <laughs> like, I think we ran for so many years on a budget, like Laura said, that was attached to my bank account. Like we didn't, we didn't have any idea where anything was. If there was money in the bank, we were spending it. So until we started working with a consultant and really getting an idea of what everything costs, then that's when we were able to really zone in on, there's a, there's a few big numbers, right? You've got your commissions, you've got your inventory. Those two things, if those are in, in check, pretty much everything else can work. So really understanding where your color inventory is, where your front end inventory is, uh, where your ba uh, wages are. Uh, I talked to a lot of new people that are starting businesses and um, they want, everybody wants to pay their staff as much money as they possibly can without right. the realization, knowing that once you do that, it's so hard to go backwards. And we've went all over the board with our commissions from high to low to medium to like, we've changed them in 23 years, probably four different times. Right. And you're always having to grandfather those people in um, at that higher commission. So getting real clear as to what it's going to cost you to run a shop um is really i think something that i probably didn't learn until i was 10 years in and maybe still learning a little bit because i'm a tr true hairdresser i just want to i want to give it all away so that everybody is happy and um, at the end of the day after 23 years there needs to be something left over for us so that yeah. most of my team would never do the job that i do sometimes for the amount of money i get paid yeah absolutely yeah. And that, yeah. you know, that's such a great point. And, you know, <laughs> I, I'm the same way. And I think we're so guilty as hairdressers doing that, giving it all away um, and not really considering ourselves. But, oh, I think it's something's in the air today, Laura, because I'm, I'm, I'm on a great trade, a thought trade right there. And it's just derailed. But, um, oh, yes, I was going to talk about your spreadsheets for both of you. Um, and cash flow projections. You know, I look at where I was when I started my salons and I, you know, now that I'm in a very different business, you know, every decision we make really, I mean, there's not much decisions that happen from the hip. So how much do, uh, how, how often or how much do both of you rely on your cash flow projections and your spreadsheets to make decisions before you experiment in terms of how much commission can we pay? Like how much do you rely on that for your decision-making now versus uh in the past i think for for myself when we went to change through the pandemic change our commissions i felt like i worked on it for uh, every different possible scenario for probably a month <clears throat> going through running the spreadsheets if we bring in this and we get that and this and that and the other thing and then spoke to my consultants and ran it by them and just said like to me and not just looking at your commissions but then throwing that right into like your whole PL and going, okay, this is the way I see it. And still after doing it for a month and running it through some pretty smart people, I still didn't get it exactly the way that we needed to get it to kind of thing. But it was, I meet with my, um, my bookkeeper every single week. She, she does all of our payroll. She does, she's accountant bookkeeper. She does a little bit of everything. And we're talking about cash flow. And honestly, I just started doing that when, she was like, Jared, we need to make some changes. And I'm like, oh, so how long do we have? And she's like, like today. It needs yeah. to happen today. And really that falls back onto, onto me for not, for living in this world of going, okay, we're doing okay, we're doing okay. But really sitting there and going, well, how far out, if nothing changes today, how many months can we stay in business for? And knowing that we have our, right now, all of our issues come down to a sales issue. That's why we're hiring so quickly is, because we're running a company that should be doing 10 million and we're running it at five because it just, the pandemic has done that to us. So we've got to get to 10 in the next 18 months. So what do we need to do? Cause the staff wants to have all the same things. Right. They want to have all the education. They want to have all the parties. They want to have all of these things. Right. And we can talk about where that comes from. Well, that comes from bringing your stuff through Vish, it comes through selling your retail, it comes to coming to work every single day. That's how we're going to get there. Um, but we have to go there. So just really looking at what we can 
spend our money on, what we can save our money on, what we can postpone, um, but get real clear as to where the money is going. And my last question for you, Jeremy, um, on that same similar topic, how much time do you spend on the business versus in the business? How much time behind the chair? How much time behind the books? Uh, barely any behind the chair. Okay. I probably have five clients that are really basically my friends that yeah. they still pay me. They come in, they pay me to get a haircut, but it's mostly for me to be able to hang out with them. Majority right. of my time is spent on uh, educating our mentors, uh, doing the one-on-ones, growing the business from that point of view, um, and then looking for opportunities. So I spend a lot of time on Zoom. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. How, um, how I mean, because I'm, I'm, I am quite familiar with strategies and how they work and all your cash flow projections. I mean, that's one thing that they hold salons really accountable for. Uh, mm -hmm. And they built a great program with the, um, with the command center, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Dukoff, if you're listening, I have listened and I pay attention. <laughs> uh, um, how, how, I mean, everything you do, I imagine is based off of that, right? Like very structured planning. Is, is that accurate? Yes. And, you know, some periods or some seasons, I do better with it than others. Admittedly, I am much more comfortable with the creative side of things and, you know, growing people and relationships and marketing. All of that's very comfortable and familiar for me. Yeah. The, the finance side of the business, the black and white, the you know, that it's not something I enjoy. So I've had to really work at committing to that and being more disciplined. Um, and it, you know, it's great to have all the spreadsheets and do all the planning and all of that. But what I did for years is I always looked at it after the fact. So I would review a PL after the fact, you know. And right. so what what I've been trying to do um, is be more proactive. We do a cash flow plan. Um, I have someone who does all of our bookkeeping and she actually plugs all that information in for me. Um, and it, it does, once, once you are looking at it more um, consistently, it definitely helps make more financially based decisions, you know, whether to go to this conference or not, or whether we can afford to do raises or not. Um, so just, you know, like with the kind of the whole theme of what we've talked about today, the more information that you have and the smarter than that you use it, the better. Yeah. And then for, same question for you. How much time you're not behind the chair at all. I know that. I am not. Have you ever been a service provider? Yes. I, I have a, a license um, and I keep it current just in case I get pulled in to do a shampoo or a finish or something. Um, but my passion has always been for the business side and, and growing people and coaching and mentoring. So I spend 100% of my time working on the business and not behind the chair. Great. Well, listen, I thank you both. I know we sort of, you know, deviated the original topic and talked a lot about commission structure, but I think it's all relevant because I think it all helps us determine, you know, what we should be charging and how much our services are. And for those of you, um, you know, we talked about data reviews and quarterly reviews on this. I just want to extend this to everybody. If you haven't had a data review and you would like one, please reach out to your BISH rep. I'd be happy to do it. There are no charge to have these done. Uh, so you reach out to your BISH rep. And if you're not sure who that is, please reach out directly to me, Timothy at GetBISH.com. And I'd be happy to, uh, to, to arrange a data review for you. Um, it's important to do them. It's important to really know your numbers. And for those of you who've been using Vish for a while, you know, I know some people don't look at it as often as they should. And perhaps we've changed some things that maybe you're not clear of. There's a new sales module in your dashboard in the last few months. And we'll continue to be rolling out some changes. Uh, so the analytics are uh, more in depth and provide more value and benefit for you. So please reach out if you'd like to have a data review. We're happy to, to do them at any time. Um, again, I just want to thank both of you, uh, Laura and Jeremy, for, for taking time out of your busy schedules, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us. I thank you very much. Um, and uh, you. I look forward to, you know, I look forward to longer and more continued success and profitability uh, with all of you. Sounds thank good. You. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Happy Thanks, Monday. Sir. Take care. Happy Monday. Bye.